Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the Green Halo Systems training session for city representatives. This is an opportunity to learn about the online platform that you will use for overseeing and managing a material reduction and recovery plan, or MRRP, to track building materials leaving the construction site for reuse, recovery, or disposal. I'm Eden Bruckman, Senior Green Building Coordinator at the Department of the Environment, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Kalaya Cruz. We're also incredibly fortunate to have Manny Mendoza, the Technical Services Manager with Green Halo Systems. Manny is going to lead this walkthrough today, but before I hand it over to him, I just want to offer a bit of context and general information. I expect that many of you are familiar with the paper process that has been used up until now for material reduction and recovery plans. Environment Code Chapter 7 includes detailed requirements for the MRRP, which used to be called the Construction and Demolition Debris Management Plan, as well as the summary of diversion that the general contractor submits with each payment application throughout construction and the final diversion report. Most often, the general contractor used Form C, Construction and Demolition Debris Recovery Worksheet, to organize the information and manually calculate and record their progress. But now, Green Halo Systems will streamline the process for the entire project team. The Department of Building Inspection currently requires all new construction and most additions and commercial alterations to use Green Halo Systems to demonstrate compliance with the construction waste management requirements set forth by the California Green Building Standards Code, Cal Green. We can provide you with a link to that information sheet from uh, following this training if you would like to have it for your reference. For municipal projects, all projects starting construction on or after January 1st of this year should use Green Halo systems. For projects that have already started using the paper forms, it is acceptable to finish on paper. But if you've started and you're still in early days, you may want to consider migrating to the online platform. The folks at Green Halo Systems have been diligently working with the Department of the Environment to customize portions of the platform so that it can best meet the needs of San Francisco municipal projects. Manny is going to cover a lot of ground today, but in the limited time that we have for the training, we will not be able to cover all of the functionality that this platform has to offer. We will be distributing a user guide with further details and step-by-step -step instructions that you can look to as you're getting started or whenever you need a refresher. Of course, we'll also make the recording of this session available as well. One more important thing to mention, each of your departments have an administrative generic agency account and several departments have already assigned points of contact who will oversee this account. This is key, so to reiterate, your administrator will be responsible for initiating a project in the platform, creating your account, and handing off the project to you. This means that you will be coordinating with that designated point of contact in your department to get your account and your project set up in the system. Here are the points of contact that have already been assigned. For Public Works, Building Design and Construction Division, it's Damon Louie and Melina Markarian. For Rec Park Capital and Planning Division, it's Sean McFadden, Felix Tong, and Lauren Dietrich Chavez. For the Port, it's Anna Brust and Rich Berman. And for the Airport, it's Anthony Bernheim and Emily Nod. If your department or division does not yet have a point of contact, there's no need for concern. Please coordinate internally and then contact SFE staff to get your administrators set up with the generic agency account. The best email to reach us about this or any questions related to the MRRP is debrisrecovery at sfgov.org. That's debris, D-E-B-R-I-S, recovery at sfgov.org. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of this training, but also please feel free to put questions in the Q&A or click on the raise hand icon in the participant window if you have a question related to something in real time. We'll do our best to monitor and interject when there's a natural pause in the training. I think that covers the introductory notes. Manny, I'll turn it over to you. 
Okay, thank you, Aiden. Uh, so yeah, great intro there. And again, this is Manny Mendoza with the uh, Green Halo team over here. So we're the uh, software behind uh, this platform. And yeah, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So uh, this is the portal, sfgov.wastetracking.com. Um, it's really important to just note the gov, uh, sfgov, because there is a sf.wastetracking portal. So just wanted to, you know, again, point that out. Uh, it's the sfgov.wastetracking portal. Um, give me one second. Sorry, this bar is up here on the screen. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, sfgov.wastetracking.com. This is a public site. So at any point, feel free to visit this. Uh, you know, so we're not going to focus too much on this. Uh, we are going to focus uh, for the most part on your uh you know your role your task as the city rep um my understanding is that there are some contractors on this um you know in this in this meeting here as well uh so we are going to be doing some of the uh you know the components or the uh filling out of the mrrp that the contractor does um so yeah let's, let's jump right into it. so sfgov.wastetracking.com uh there's a couple of buttons here one is your login email and password and Again, if you are not set up in the system just yet, you can have your, your city administrator uh, set you up. Um, there is this create your debris recovery plan, but that doesn't apply to this portal. So you can kind of ignore that for now. Uh, as far as this actual portal, you have your social media stuff. You have some pictures here in rotation, the SFE logo. If we do scroll down, um, eventually this will have more data. So the projects that do exist in here are either mock-up projects, or I think the airport has a couple of projects in here. And so that's what is uh, adding to this to this data here. Um, and so this first section is the recovery reports. And the next section is the material reports. Again, I won't focus on this too much. At any point, you can come to the portal. And I'd say in about six months to 12 months, you know, as more projects enter into the system, these reports are really going to be more applicable and have some really cool trends and uh, be able to, you know, see, see that data. Uh, down below, we have the material reports section, and this is just tracking the, you know, the different materials that are coming off of these projects. Below this, we have our tech support number. Um, you don't have to write it down. It's also throughout the system at the very top when we actually log in, live chat assistance, and then just another way to log in here as well. Uh, so again, this is the exterior of the portal. It's public. Anyone with this with uh, knowledge of this can visit this and uh, just kind of see what's going on. In order to access the system, you do need to log in, email password, log in. And I've gone ahead and logged in here. And this is, uh, you know, when you first log in, this is the, uh, I guess, the landing page, um, if you will. And what you'd like to do here is get to your project right so there's a few ways to get into your project and right now there's only what about 30 or so projects if you look 10 2 4 1 4 11 30 or so um, eventually you know when your project does enter into the system um, you're going to have to you know locate that project there's a few ways to do that one is to run a search notice here you can search for uh, you know by the project address the name of the project the green halo tracking number the permit number uh, PM, account holder, you can even just do a general search. So for example, since there are some airport projects in here, if I type in the acronym for the airport, AIR, I'm going to see several of different of uh, these uh, airport projects, the different uh, statuses, some of them are upcoming, pending, active, you know, final and completed. So that's one way to locate your project. Uh, you know, thinking about this now, the, the, you know, the easier and the most, you know, easiest way to the most likely find a project is by searching for the permit number. Um, if you search a permit number, you should kind of uh, narrow down your results here. No, notice the difference there. But again, the, the main thing is just knowing that you can search by different criteria and getting to the point where you see your project, right? Um, with that being said, we're, we're not gonna focus too much on creating a, a project. I am going to touch on it a little bit. This is more for the city administrators and these city administrators, we've already done a training with them. So they know how to set up projects. They uh, essentially, when you log in as a city rep, you're at the point where they've passed you the project and now you are to continue with filling out the project information. Uh, but just just to really quickly, you know, I know, I know people are going to be curious, how is a project set up by my city administrator? 
that is done like this. You click on create plan for client. They then identify the zip code and they click create. Uh, what that does is it then creates the project in this plans for client section. And when you're first filling this, this uh, project information for your project, your project is gonna be in this plans for client section. So if you were to log in and just go into plans for client and search, you know, based on, you know, the number of projects in here with the address and the, on the map, or just kind of scroll down and just, you know, look for your project. Um, you, you're going to see it listed here in this plans for client section. Uh, and in this case, the project that we're dealing with today is a um, mission street public library alteration, which I've already set up here. Uh, uh, I've acted as the city administrator and I've set up the project. And if we open up this project, I, I can do that by clicking any one of these links here, this link. Let me zoom this in a little bit. So again, that was this green halo tracking number, this permit number, or you can just click on where it says start here. So I'll go ahead and click on start here. Uh, other things to notice here are we see the, uh, again, the address. Uh, one thing to really point out here is there is no contractor information because that's where we're going to head in, in a little bit. Um, everything's grayed out, meaning there's you know no, not, no data at the moment. Um, you know, there's some other stuff here as far as when this was created. Uh, it hasn't been approved yet, active, you know, that type of stuff. Um, but this the status of this is that it, it is in progress. So we're going to go ahead and uh, click on start here. And what we are doing is we are entering into this project information section. So one thing to really, really emphasize here is um, me as the city administrator, for example, for Department of Public Works, I have uh, at a minimum most likely filled out the project name, most likely the project street address. Um, you know, I've entered the zip code and it populates this information here. And most likely I've done my, you know, provided the permit number uh, slash project number for, you know, this here. Uh, if I'm the administrator for the public um, Department of Public Works, most likely I've also selected, you know, whether this is a, uh, in this case, DPW alteration, DPW full demolition, DPW new construction. And we're just focusing on, you know, DPW today, but if you notice your department should be in here and you should also have alteration, full demolition and new constructions. Uh, with that being said, uh, an another thing to, to highlight here is depending on the, you know, the, the city administrator and what they fill out, this information might be entirely filled out for you and you kind of just need to confirm the information, maybe edit and update it. Um, in some other cases, uh, this information, if the city administrator, for example, does not know the project start date, the project end date, project cost, square footage, this might be some information that you have to gather and uh, fill out. So at any point, let, let's say you don't know the project cost, you can go ahead and hit save plan and come back to this tomorrow if um, you, know, you, you have to budget out or calculate whatever the numbers and then come back to this and enter your project cost. Um, same thing with square footage, job description. So the, the main thing here is when this is passed to you from the city admin as a city rep, some of this information may all be filled out, some of it may not. You are going to be responsible for making sure that this project information, and by that I mean, if you notice this, this table here, you're responsible for making sure that this information is filled out. You can even add to it, for example, here in the description. And uh, the next thing we have here is the upload the material reduction and recovery plan. So this is, uh, you know, the MRRP. So let me provide an example of this. So we're going to go ahead and do uh, upload file. And in this case, let's see, we're choosing that file. And we're going to go ahead and presentation. Oops, wrong file here, presentation. And let's also actually uh, preview this file. Uh, that way we kind of know uh, what it is. So let's go ahead and open this. And also let's select this file at the same time. So we're going to go ahead and upload this uh, file here, upload PDF. And while that loads into the system, uh, this is a sample uh, MRRP that we uh, we have here. So this is uh, something that is for the San Francisco PUC. 
web core builders, a nice image there. And this document is about 11 pages. So this is what you're looking to upload into that specific, uh, you know, upload project description, uh, you know, field there. So most likely this is a familiar form. Uh, if not, uh, you know, here we have section one and I won't focus too much on this particular form. Uh, the main thing is, is, you know, we've successfully uploaded this project description file. And if we, um, if we go in here and we, and we see, we see that the file has been uploaded. If we uploaded the incorrect file, we can delete it. Um, one thing to know here is this is not a required field. Notice uh, there's no asterisk here, but most likely you will have this and you should upload this if you do have it. Um, if for whatever reason you don't have it, um, it, you know, I guess even backtracking, if the city administrator doesn't upload it, then you as a city rep should upload it. But if you don't upload it, then the contractor can also upload it. So, you know, don't worry too much about this, but in, in order to, you know, pass this along to the contractor, you should fill out the required uh, fields, as you can see here. Um, the next thing is, by default, uh, this target rate is going to display at 65%. This is because of the uh, the Cal Green uh, requirements. The, the state law is essentially 65%. Um, from my understanding, with speaking with uh, Eden and James, most of these you know municipal projects will be lead projects, and so most of these had to adhere to a 75% requirement. So uh, you will have to. You know, if, if you do need to meet the 75% target rate, you will have to up this to 75%. Um, so it's as simple as just changing it from 65 to 75, you know, and, and that's just as of right now, right? Some projects later on may need to do 80 or if they're lead platinum, for example, you may need to do 90 or 95%. I'm, I'm not a, a lead expert, but the system does have some lead information, but just know that uh, if it is a lead project, you know, that just kind of changes everything, right? You need to do more way streams, you know, and, and we'll get all into all of that as we fill out the uh, MRP as the contractor. Uh, but just know that you're, you're basically setting a 75% target rate here. Uh, again, maybe I don't have my designated contacts and this is just me. I like to hit save plan uh, every once in a while. And also the system does auto save, but um, I think it's like every minute. So save plan, I just like to do that every once in a while. And the next thing here is the, the designated contacts. So here it's really important to point out that this doesn't do anything as far as, you know, functional wise. So we're going to go in here in the designated contacts and we're going to designate, you know, you know, a few people. Let's assume that uh, Anthony is part of DPW. So we're going to go ahead and select Anthony. Maybe he's the city admin. Let's assume that I am the city rep. So I'm going to go ahead and assign myself. Uh, at this point, if I have a contractor, let's, you know, WebCore, DPR, Scan, Sky Turner, whoever it is, I'm going to go ahead and assign those people. So we have a contractor here in Griffin Hyde. Let's just select this person. Um, you know, it, it, at this point, you can assign whoever it is that just needs that is involved with the project. It's just, you know, if you were to print this project out or share it or print out a PDF, you know, you could have basically the contractor. Uh, subcontractors, architects, green building consultants, lead consultants, city admin, city rep, you know, the, the full list of people that have been involved with this project. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that everyone is going to get access to this. This project is managed and controlled by one person, and it is going to be, uh, once you pass it to the contractor, you're going to, that contractor is going to be the one that is responsible to, to fill out the MRRP and to ensure that everything is in compliance. So just wanted to point that out there. And if you don't see a contact in here, you can go ahead and do add designated contact, enter that person's name, add user. And that's just adding, again, another person to this list. So in a second here, we're gonna see several people listed. Again, you can have four, one, 20 people listed here. Um, let's see, I am seeing some questions come in. So you know, most of these, Questions I believe we'll probably answer at the very end, but I uh, just know that I am seeing, uh, you know, some of these questions. And uh, for example, the last question: Who uploads the MRRP? The contractor, right? Contractor, right? Um, again, if, you know, it, most likely it is the contractor, uh, but if the city rep has it already, 
then the city rep can uh, upload it. it. It's not just limited to just a contractor. So I'd say, it, you know, a good plan of action is if you have it, upload it. If not, the contractor is going to upload it. Um, and at this point, uh, we are going to move on to, uh, you know, the next step, which is not clicking this button next step, but just saving this. And the reason that I'm saying not move on to the next step is because the next step is uh, actually assigning this project. So you are not responsible. So as the city rep, you are not responsible for identifying the materials, transportation facilities and that. So we're actually going to go over here to the home button. And we can close this and we're going back to the plans for clients section just because we know our project is, uh, you know, listed here at the top. Again, we could just search for it if we wanted to. And what we're going to do here is we are going to uh, go into this function section because now that we've filled out the, the project, the project information, uh, step one specifically, we're ready to assign this to a contractor. Notice right now, this uh, is not uh, assigned to a contractor, right? So we're gonna go ahead and do functions and that's this little menu here. And we're going to assign project. This is you know, uh, really important to highlight a few things. We are not assigning this from you know, me as the city rep to another city rep. If the city rep needs to access this, they need to actually go and get access to the system via you know, the settings uh, being added as a user. So that can be done by a, a, another city rep uh, or a city administrator, mo most likely. So this is really important because we are assigning this from the city rep to the contractor. So we need to go in here and make sure we assign this to a contractor. Um, before we even assign this just now, one other thing to point here is that um, let's say we want to let's let's stick with WebCore, right? If we want to assign this to WebCore, we are going to assign project and we are, for example, going to type in Mary at WebCore.com. We have to wait for Mary to accept and take ownership of this project. We don't want to assign it to Mary. You know, when we hit find, it's going to tell us this person is not located. That's fine. We're going to invite them. Um, you know, the, the main thing is, is once we invite Mary, we're not going to go in here and assign this to Joe and do find Joe is also not located. This means that they're not, they haven't ever used the green halo system, right? So if we, if we do some other emails, like let's do my email here, find, uh, I'm a contractor in the system and my email address is located. Notice how, instead of saying invite, it says assign. Ideally, if you know that a contractor has used Green Halo before, you would want to, you know, assign this to that specific person at that company who has used the system before. That way, you know, they already have a Green Halo account. They're familiar with it, um, you know, th that type of deal. So the main thing is, is if I assign this to, you know, let us, let's assume this is a contractor at WebCore. I hit find and I do assign we have to wait until M Mendoza accepts the project. You don't want to assign it from Manny to, to Joe, to Barbara, uh, because there's a link that goes out to them for them to accept the project. And you need to wait for one person to accept that project. So if you send it out to person A, B, and C, if you sent it to person C last, that link is only active for person C. You've essentially, uh, canceled out those other email notifications. So for to give you an example, person A will go in and check for that email. They'll get that email. They click the link and it's going to say, nope, this link has expired because you've already sent it again and again to person, you know, for example, person C. So I just wanted to really, really emphasize that part. Um, you know, uh, and again, we're going to go ahead and enter the email, hit find. I'm going to do a sign and an email is going to be generated to M Mendoza. I'll show you that email here in a second. Um, just a couple of things that I'd like to point out, which are, you know, I'm not going to go in here and I'm not going to assign it to another person. I'm going to wait until M Mendoza accepts the project. Um, if I did type in the wrong email for M Mendoza and it should have gone to M Mendoza at Yahoo, that's, that's fine. You know, ju just know that they need to now click in that email in the Yahoo one. Um, so just to give you an example of what this notification looks like, 
this it this uh here it is so let's see i think we have a more recent one new project uh assigned so this notification new project assigned 300 bartley street city and county of san francisco is just a standard notification with the address and the permit number uh, this project has been assigned to you by the jurisdiction this is that link that i'm talking about if i click this link now i am accepting the project and uh, i i now will then uh, take ownership of this project so um that that's what I'm, I'm referring to we don't want to send this email out to several people so i think we've made that pretty clear at this point so let's go ahead and switch over to the uh you know plans for clients section so what we're going to do now is um let me see i'm clicking in the link in that email and i'm going to do a refresh here uh and by that i mean uh, notice how there's 11 plans for client and 10 upcoming if we do a refresh notice that plans for client went down upcoming went up uh, i'm going to zoom out a little bit and what has happened is you've done your role uh, as the city rep you su successfully you know this project was passed to you from the city admin and you've filled out all the information you know basically set the requirements for the project you've assigned it to the contractor and if we go to upcoming 11 we are going to see uh, this project that was just accepted by the contractor. Normally here in this field, you're gonna see you know, a contractor, right? Webcore, Skanska, DPR, Turner, for example. So you're gonna know that that person, um, click the link in the email. You know, Keep in mind, um, if they don't click on the email right away, it's not gonna be so instantaneous. They might click the, the email tomorrow that project is going to exist here until they accept it. Um, and at this point, I've accepted the project and we can go ahead and click on start here. I'm going to actually switch over to this project because this is one we did from our training on Tuesday and it's already filled out. So it's going to kind of expedite this process. We'll still kind of go over everything, but it's going to expedite everything. So we're going to go ahead and do start here. And again, we have the project information. And at this point, the contractor can, um, you know, verify this information if everything looks good. One thing you might be wondering about the project block lot number is, you know, what is that? So you, you'd be able to just copy and paste the address or, or type it in and basically do find block lot number, um, search by address. And once this loads, here we have our uh, block slash lot number, which is going to be this number here. So um, just wanted to point that out there. And that's what's listed there. Start date, end date. The contractor might say, hey, this project, you know, might go one extra month, you know, by the time that they get to the point of filling this out. The project costs, square footage. Again, if I don't have the MRRP, I can go ahead and upload that one. At this point, this example doesn't have that file. So I'm going to go ahead and just, you know, select this. So now I'm acting as the contractor and um, yeah, let's go ahead and get in here with this file and let's upload. And at this point, uh, once this loads, we are now ready to, you know, just confirm the rest of the information. This is, this is the contractor. You've done a really nice job of presenting and listing all your designated contacts and doing all this and, um, you know, we're ready to move on to the next step. That next step is going to be identifying the materials. So material selection. We're going to kind of just fly through this because this is not a city rep task. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of fly through this. So um, there's more information here as far as lead. There's some information here as far as hazardous materials. Um, a, a, you know, basically saying attach all your manifest and or abatement inspection reports. This does not decrease your project recovery rate, um, you know, that type of stuff. From the contractor's perspective, um, and depending also on the project, they may want to specify their estimates for the materials in cubic yards or tons. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit just so we can kind of see a little bit more of the different materials that are available to select from. And in my, uh, you know, you know, from my experience, uh, I prefer to work with cubic yards, especially, you know, in a, a, 
you know, if it's within the city of San Francisco limits, right, the city limits, just because of a lot of places will not have um, space or capacity to, to leave dumpsters on the street or, um, you know, a library might have a parking lot and in that parking lot we can leave two can 220 cubic yard containers and so i prefer to work with cubic yards in other cases if i just know my tons i can toggle to tons but in this case um yeah let's go ahead and just jump right into it so this this library project um you know because it's a library you know essentially a ti or a renovation we're going to have some construction debris most projects have construction debris and we are treating this project as a lead project um, if you're not familiar with LEED, you know, you're going to have to just, you know, you can learn a little bit of basic information, but even here it's going to point out to the USGBC. So you're going to have to know that, you know, if I'm doing LEED XYZ or, you know, LEED goal, LEED plan on LEED silver, I need to have three waste streams, you know, plus RCI certified facilities. So this, that's just a whole, we could spend a whole day learning about that. So we're not going to get too into it, but because this is a LEED project. Um, and if your project is in lead, you can probably just select mixed construction debris and move on to the next step. So that, that's something that, you know, again, this is more for the contractors. But if it is a lead project, you know, we're maybe we're going to go ahead and select ceiling tiles. So we'll do 40 cubic yards of ceiling tiles, um, 40 cubic yards of, you know, stucco or drywall. We'll go ahead and do uh, 30 cubic yards of clean wood. I've even gone ahead and, or I'm gonna go ahead and specify some wood that's been treated and painted, um, you know, for, you know, this is considered now a hazardous material. So the hazardous materials are at the bottom. Um, let's go ahead and throw maybe one or two materials more in here. So we're gonna go ahead and do 20 cubic yards of metal. Um, you know, I'm trying to keep it relative to a library project, right? If your project is an airport project, you might generate, you know, concrete, you might estimate concrete, you might have dirt, soil, clean fill. Um, and in this case, let's go ahead and do some carpet. You know, most libraries do have carpet. So let's do, I don't know, 80 cubic yards of that uh, carpet. So at this point, we're ready to move on to the next step. Um, and again, we're acting as the contractors. They can, most contractors will know how to do this because they've done this, um, you know, especially if it's, uh, you know, the most of these municipal projects get awarded to contractors that have used green halo. So just wanted to point that out there. You don't, and again, this is in a city rep role or task. Uh, we'll go to the next step. As you go to the next step, Manny, if I could just interject for mm -hmm. folks um, looking at uh, just looking at that listing of the individual source separated versus mixed debris. Keep in mind that all municipal projects are required to recover 75% of materials from the site. And given the um, third party verified rates that we're seeing, you will have to do some sort of separation in order to meet that goal. So um, it probably won't be as simple as <laughs> as just choosing a mixed degree as as much as as, as we can, the, our facilities are doing as much as they can. We're going to need to rely on on site accountability in order to meet our goals. Thanks, Manny. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you so much. Um, and then again, the contractor now is on this transportation method. How are we removing uh, these these items off of these projects? So, you know, it, it, depending on the project, its limitations, you know, if, if they're able to place uh, dumpsters roll offs, then they're going to go in here and select a roll off company. And I've already selected four star hauling, but just to give you an idea as to which ones are available, I think this list has close to 30. Um, you can search specifically for, you know, the ones that, you know, if you know the name of it, you can search there. Otherwise, um, this list uh, is uh, here. And basically, these are the service providers that can provide roll off containers. So actually, it's more than 30. So it's 43. These are the different providers listed here. Um, in this case, you know, I've selected four star hauling. So I'm just gonna go ahead and leave them selected. And if, if that's it, I'm, I can move on to the next step. Um, but just real quickly here, as far as, uh, let's say we're not doing dumpsters, right? Roll offs. Um, we have this list that is managed by the uh, department of SFE and we have, uh, you know, full list, to, you know, full list to choose from really quickly. This list is, um, you know, there's 330 selections here. And again, you can do a search up here. 
and you'll see all the different ones that have the, the word bay in it or in the address. Um, and, you know, the difference between a roll off and a registered transporter, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go ahead and select one of these. I'm going to just stick with the roll off. But the difference between that and a registered transporter is that these will just, you know, haul away the materials. No, no, uh, they won't leave the roll offs. Um, so they just, you know, they're just transporters. Um, and then the last option down here is I'll be selecting self hauling. Uh, and in some cases, the contractors, just because of limitations, right, they can't, you know, um, they're, they might be showing up doing the work and then hauling the stuff at the end of the day themselves. So self haul and agree to the self haul guidelines. And you're, you're not limited to just this or this or this. You could do this and or this and or this. So it might be very common to, you know, see something like, a roll off for the, you know, just once it gets full, they're going to roll it off. But at the same time, the subcontractors who are doing the drywall, they're going to haul away their drywall scraps and you still want to keep track of those. And you're not going to get a dedicated dumpster just for clean drywall, right? So you might have them self haul the materials. So again, th this is the contractor filling this out, but just to give you some different scenarios and some ideas and the options that are available. And we're going to, at this point, we're going to move on to the next step with both of these selections here four star uh, hauling providing roll offs and the contractors hauling some of the stuff away. This next step is now identifying the facilities and uh, again another emphasis this is for the contractor to fill out but we we will see um, several facilities listed here and we do have to select a facility per each material right so if we're doing lead and we're going to take this to uh, for example recology you actually have to select Recology, uh, the one that is lead project disqualifying ADC. The difference between these two is that this has a diversion rate of 67, lead disqualifies ADC, and it is actually 11 points or 11% lower than you know, this rate. So if, if you are doing a lead project, you have to select the lead facilities. Uh, with that being said, you know, there's more of a, you know, like a, of a, not a discrepancy, but more of a gap between facilities um, in this mix C and D category, as well as the others, but more in this one, for example, that 11 percentage gap. Um, we're not get, gonna get too into as to what is ADC. We're not gonna you know, get into as far as how these diversion rates are updated, but they're basically they're third party certified. Um, and again, this you, it's not just this. I mean, in this case, it's not just this, and I, I can't select here as well because it is possible that the mixed construction debris is going to go on some days here on other days here so you are you can select this as well so it, it could be something where it's like this and this and this for the mix c and d that's where we at this point in time you know it's it's a plan so at this point in time this is where we believe it's going to go to um for the purpose of keeping this simple, I am not selecting B green recycling just because I don't like this 14% diversion rate. So I just, I'm staying away from that right now. Um, and so again, we're looking at just mix C and D facilities, specifically lead ones. And this is for mix C and D. We're gonna scroll a little bit. Uh, and, and I guess while we're scrolling, just to point out a couple of things, this listing is in order of closest to the project site address to uh, you know try to minimize carbon impact on, you know, we don't want people taking stuff to like Bakersfield, for example, right? So just wanted to point that out there. Like, for example, Zanker is on here and they're a great, uh, you know, facility. It's just, they're further out, 34 miles away. Uh, next thing is the carpeting. So in, in this case, we see some facilities. Again, I might take it here, I might take it here, but if I do see the option to select the lead one, I'm gonna go with that one. And this is what I mean by like the, the gap or the discrepancy, even though it's lead without ADC, it's still 100%. Okay, so we, we've gone over two materials. So I'm just gonna kind of speed through this here. Um, you know, I'm gonna just keep it simple, Recology, top of the list because it's there, uh, close closest to the city limits. So that's it for my ceiling tiles. Um, for my drywall, I'm going to also select Recology. I'll, I'll do Davis Street here as well. So I'm just gonna fly through this. And once we get to the bottom, we should be seeing the hazardous materials eventually. And 
let's take a look for the hazardous material we have it at the bottom um if i try to go to the next step uh i have not selected a facility for treated painted wood and i have not agreed to these terms so i, I can't move on until i actually fill this out properly by that i mean in this case uh we have to agree to these uh city of san francisco sfe guidelines as far as hazardous materials and we actually have to select the facility. So in this case, there's only two available for the wood that's been treated and painted. And I'm going to go ahead and select the lead one, which there's no difference here. So it doesn't matter. Um, at this point, we've identified, I'm, I'm going to do this at the very top, the next step. We've identified our facilities. And we're going to move on to the next step, which is, uh, you know, if everything looks good, we are going to then, uh, let's see. Oh, I should have actually done this as a contractor. Uh, I, I'm noticing I'm doing this as the uh, city. Uh, but anyways, on the contractor side, it would say, uh, let's go ahead and toggle over. It, it's gonna say, um, you know, good or bad based on what we've filled out. So let's see. So uh, let's see. Okay, I'm just gonna stick with this screen. So on the contractor side, again, we don't need to focus too much on that. The contractor submits this over to the city. What we do wanna focus on is the contractor, once they submit it to you, you are going to get a notification saying new project submitted. And that is a notification that looks like this one. And we will, uh, you know, you know, it'll have your project uh, address, permit number, that type of stuff. And you'll be able to log in and you'll get a ping of this project. So um, let me see here. Yeah, so once that project um, goes into the, let's, let's see what happens when we do start project. Okay, so I think in this case, this project is gonna go into an active status, which is fine, but um, if we take a look at one of these other projects that is pending, these projects are projects that have been submitted to the city, and we actually have one that we, uh, we did on Tuesday, so perfect. So we're gonna go ahead and open up this project. So now you've gotten that notification saying project has been submitted. What that means is that if you recognize that project, you will you know have to log in and view this project. and uh, basically, the goal is to get to the point where we are approving it. So let's go ahead and open this project up. So all I've done is I've clicked on this green halo tracking number. You can click on this and we now start to see some information, right? So in this case, this is not a good, the best example because this project only has a 65% requirement um, or it only is, is hitting 65%. And that's perfectly fine. Some of these projects you're going to be able to reject and, and um, have them amend their MRRP and resubmit to you. So the main thing to take away from this is you have your project information. Um, you go into the project stats, for example. And in this case, we know that this project needs to uh, do a 75% requirement, but they submitted this with 60, you know, 68% roughly. We also see that they have about 20, you know, plus 10, about 31 tons or so. And so th that's fine. Some projects might have 100 tons, some might have 30 tons. And the main takeaway here is, you know, are they meeting our requirements? Um, the city requirement is is 75% on this project. Here we have some inert and non inert stuff. This will kind of populate later on once they start to enter their tickets. And also, did they report any or are they estimating any hazardous stuff? And if they are, um, you would see it here. And then at this point, there's no data available for this either. So the, the main thing is, is, you know, are they meeting the 60 or the 75% requirement and how many tons are they estimating? The next thing is, who are they using for transportation? Are they using uh, four star hauling? Are they using allied waste? You know, if it's if these are these are going to be from that list of uh, registered, um, you know, roll off services. So you're going to see various uh, selections here. And in this case, they're also uh, choosing to self-haul. The next thing is, what type of materials did they estimate on their plan? So that other one that we filled out had, you know, its own set list of materials. In this case, we have some carpet and padding, drywall, 
um, mix C and D. And we're just going to scroll to the very bottom and we're going to take a look at this. So in this case, we have carpet, drywall, mix C and D, and hazardous material, which is the wood that's treated and painted. And these are the facilities and these are the estimates that are going to these facilities. So at this point, we can just go ahead and uh, you, you don't need to look at facilities and tickets and these things here. You can actually message them if you if you wanted to and ask about, hey, why are you choosing, why, why are you targeting 68% when the requirement is 75%? You can go ahead and uh, ask them that here as well and just reject it. That way they can add more materials to their plan. Uh, ideally, you'd like to have a plan that is, you know, 90% uh, recovery. You know, if it's a lead project, seven materials, for example, you know, a good selection of trans transporters, that type of deal. And once you get to the point where, okay, I, I have either rejected this previously or, you know, hopefully, ideally, when the project comes in the very first time, it, it's a good filled out MRRP. And if so, you can go ahead and just approve plan. So that, that's the main thing that we just want to take away from this is you'll get a ping and you'll need to review the information that was filled out by the contractor. If it's acceptable, a pr approved plan. If not acceptable and you want them to make changes, reject plan. Um, what that's going to do is, you know, if you reject it, it's going to put it back in upcoming. They can make their changes. If you accept and approve of this, it's going to move it over into your active section. So let's go into this active section. And at this point in time, we see active projects. Uh, these are just projects that we've approved and the permit and the work and everything's open, active and ongoing. And here we see a couple of examples, right? So here we, we have Skanska. Um, the other projects are just kind of airport pro or uh, mock-up projects, but we do see one by Liffey Electric, uh, Golden Gate Constructors. So all of these are either mock-up or, you know, airport projects that are real live projects. Here, you don't need to do anything as far as, you know, what do I do, review this or anything like that. You just kind of let them hang out. Um, but there are a few things to take away from them, F from this. The system is going to send every 30 days um, a reminder to upload your tickets. So, for example, if this project, and this is a good example, this project hasn't done any reporting. You, you can tell by no tickets uploaded and it's still in gray. And this project has been in here for about three months. Um, so this project has most likely received two reminder notifications saying that the city of San Francisco um, wants the data to be uploaded in real time. If you have wait tickets, upload them. If you don't have wait tickets, then just ignore this because you, know, you haven't maybe started the work, for example. Um, once you have uploaded tickets or, or projects have uploaded tickets, um, what we wanna focus on here is a monthly report, right? So we can open up this project and we can go ahead and uh, let's see, where is it? We can go ahead and run this export to Excel report. So if you click this ex export to Excel, we're going to receive, we're going to be able to uh, export this file here, which is this report. And this report um, is going to give you your project details, right? So if I clicked on the SFO train project, I'm, I'm exporting this one with this address, with this start date, end date, you know, basically a, a brief uh, project project details when you uh, extracted this report. And this report is gonna give you on the left side, some expandables. By that, I mean, you have October of 2018. And if we expand that here, we have all the tickets that were entered for that specific month for that specific year. Um, here are the materials. Here's the facility that they took the stuff to, weights, how much of that was recycled, ticket numbers. And you should be able to click on, for example, click here to view, and it's gonna pull open that, uh, that ticket. Um, here it is. So the main thing from this report is that you have a way to extract a monthly report. And um, Eden, if you wanna explain a little bit as to why that, that monthly report um, you know, is important. Absolutely. So thanks, Manny. Um, so these monthly reports, and for some of you, it might be a slightly different time frame, but these are tied to the payment applications that you will receive from the general contractor. Um, and this is all uh, defined in Environment Code Chapter 7 and the regulation as well. So as part of that review process, the city representative is responsible for approving the plan and monitoring the progress towards 
the achievement of that plan. Um, you want to be able to memorialize likely the uh, time period and the activity for a time period related to a payment application. So being able to export uh, digitally that information and saving it uh, locally, uh, of course, at any time you can do this, but it might make sense to be able to keep track of that uh, so that you have a way to directly correlate with a payment application, make sure that it aligns um, and that you have that for your records. Perfect. Thank you so much. And again, that is available through this export to Excel uh, button, and this is available on any project, regardless if it's you know, upcoming, uh, submitted, active, submitted for final, completed. You can export this at any point. Um, so the next thing we want to focus on, and we're almost done as far as the training. Uh, we we kind of got the, you know, the big items out of the way. The next thing is is once this project uh, is is you know submitted for final from from the city side, you you also see the uh, submit for final. But this this button really is should be used very rarely you from the city side don't know when this project is done it could have a hundred pro oh, let's look at a different project it could have 549 tickets maybe they haven't uploaded tickets in two months but guess what they, they're gonna by the end of this they're gonna have 560 tickets or maybe even though 549 is a lot right now this project could have 3,000 at the very end so don't you, you don't want to submit for final you want to wait until the contractor submits for final and you will then get uh, you know pinged of this essentially. So let me go ahead and submit for final on a, my other browser here. Um, and let's go into this final section. And once we do submit for final, uh, let's see what's in here right now. Okay, we have a different project. So let's go ahead and just submit for final and let's do a refresh. So from the city uh, standpoint, you have now just received a project notification that says new project submitted for final. And if we take a scroll down here, we, we see that project 300 Bartlett Street. And now we know that the number of tickets that were uploaded to the project, um, that's they, they've locked it in. They've ba basically said, please review my project. I want to start to schedule my final inspections, verify compliance, occupancies, all of that type of stuff. Um, and again, from your end, you have received a notification. That notification is gonna look something like this. Uh, and then it's, it's important just to highlight a couple or one thing on this notification. So th that is that, you know, the other one said new project submitted. This one says new project submitted for final. So you can kind of set up like rules in your inbox and stuff like that to catch these. Um, and the, the other main thing is it looks similar, but it has an, a new line item here that says total number of tickets. In this case, 23 tickets for this particular project. So if I get notification and I, it says 23 tickets, that might take me, you know, it's just like a heads up, 15 minutes to review. If I get one that says total tickets 500, maybe I should probably allocate a couple of hours to that just because of, you know, the higher volume of tickets. So again, just wanted to point that out. Um, and so at this point, you've got that notification, you log in and it's time to review this project. What you'd like to do is just, you know, at a quick glance, you can again, look at the contractor stuff, you know, just real quickly, it looks like, okay, this is going to be good, you know, a high diversion rate. So we're going to open up this project and we are going to now, again, you can look at this project information at any point you could, you could, we could have edited this information, but we, we are the ones who really filled this out, right? As a city rep. So if, if I want to, I can look at it again, but I fill this out. I know what it is. So I'm just going to jump into this project statistics. This now is essentially, you know, um, what I, it, it's comparing and analyzing estimates versus actuals. What I had estimated, this is what I actually did. Um, when I estimated this, I had estimated close to, what is this, about 80 tons. I actually only ended up reporting about, let's say, 30 tons. So is that a red flag? Maybe, maybe not. It's still maybe within the standard deviation of what was supposed to be reported, possibly. So just to give you some scenarios, um, you know, you're going to have to determine your protocol. And, and if a project estimated 1,000 tons, but they uploaded 2,000 tons, most likely that's okay. But what if they only uploaded 200 is, you know, you might question it and say, where's the rest of the stuff, buddy? You know, you haven't uploaded everything. 
So just just a couple uh, analysis, a couple of scenarios. Uh, the next thing is just you know the city requirement versus you know the uh, the project requirement. So that's just letting you know it's seventy five percent requirement. Now we have the inert and the non inert, and then if there's any hazardous stuff, you would see that here. So in this case, they estimated hazardous. They didn't report any actual hazardous. And now this is the really cool part. Now that they've uploaded tickets, we're able to see this kind of like. Uh, uh, the trends, right? A lot of projects um, will generate most of their debris and their roll offs and, and basically, you know, they'll contact waste management or whoever it is. Hey, I need dumpsters now. And then maybe leave me one dumpster for the. Weeks, months, you know, not so much throughout, but, you know, three months later, they picked up my stuff. Two months after that, they picked up my stuff. And then at the end, we had, you know, one last dumpster. But the main thing here is, you know, your trends are going to be a lot more as far as the tonnage is per month. And, you know, uh, it's just a good a good way to see your, your volume trends, essentially. The next thing is, because we got about 10 minutes before the Q&A. So if anyone has to jump off, uh, you know, at three, just know that we are having a Q&A in about five to 10 minutes. Um, the next thing is the transportation. So again, four star hauling and I'm all, and there's self hauling, that's fine. Uh, the next thing is the recovered materials. So this just gives you an idea as to the breakdown of the materials. And the really nice part is at the very bottom, there's a table and this table kind of just gives you, you know, what it, what it, what it um, was as far as the um, estimates versus the actuals. So uh, again, when I filled out this plan, a year ago, because now, for example, you're reviewing this project maybe a year later. Um, a year ago, I thought I was going to have this and take the stuff here. What I actually ended up doing was I'd had carpet, concrete, drywall, and mixed CND. I did not generate metal, nor ceiling tiles, uh, nor uh, any, you know, wood clean, clean wood. And these are the facilities that I ended up taking the stuff to. And so, in this case, I mean. Um, you would have the lead one selected. So in this, I just did this, you know, really quickly, but you'd most likely you'd have the lead selected facilities and, um, you know, other possible scenarios there. Now, the main thing is we are reviewing this project, right? And this project only has four tickets to review because it's a mock-up project, but your, your, um, your project may have several. So this export weight tickets to Excel is a really nice way to just, you know, get all the tickets on a spreadsheet and if you prefer to you know review and uh, highlight the tickets and uh, you know say for example i've reviewed this ticket okay i can check it off here there's also a way to click here and view the image you know you can expand these things and basically this is the ticket that was uploaded and if if the data matches up to you know like the date the facility the material the, the weight all of that stuff if it matches up check it off and and you know if you, it's your preference if you prefer to work off of a spreadsheet or not or you could just um let's see where are we at okay so we you could just go off of this uh you know the, the web page which is the facilities and tickets here and you know just pop them open like this view and if this looks good just leave it right so um, if, if this is a mixed CND ticket, because you can see that this is supposed to be a Recology of San Francisco ticket for mixed CND submitted by Manny, ticket number, weight, and the date. So if this date matches up and if the material is correct, um, you know, and if it is a Recology of San Francisco ticket and the date matches and all that, then it's fine. Just leave it. Um, again, this is all mock-up data. So you are really looking for your Recology ticket and the, to the data to match up. If there's any inconsistencies here, you can do two things. One is if it's a small quick edit, for example, we'll pop this open. And if it's just something like they chose the wrong date, it's supposed to be you know, the first, then go ahead and just update the ticket. That's just my recommendation. Or if it's something like it should have been 8.77, update the ticket. But if they're making you know, several, um, not, not several, but just, you know, you'd rather have them fix it, then that, that's fine too. You can go ahead and reject this ticket. And there's two rejections. One is, let's go ahead and request for them to re-upload it. Or if this is a, let's say this is an airport project and, you know, it's the SFO, but you see a ticket saying the Oakland airport, somehow they got their tags mixed up um, and they're uploading 
tickets for an Oakland project, you can actually reject the ticket and delete this from the system. In any case, you will have to specify why you're rejecting it or requesting for re-upload, and then they'll most likely, you know, fix it and re-upload it. So just keep that in mind. And these are just different scenarios. Um, same thing with these other facilities. Notice how if you had 100 Recology tickets, it would just go within this table here. It would just list all the 100. But now we're we're switching over to the next facility, uh, B Green Recycling. We click View, same thing. Uh, we should be seeing the B Green Recycling, right, ticket. And uh, in this case, we're looking for it to say Drywall. It, same thing here. If, if um, they uploaded Drywall, but it was, you know, uh, you know, a different material, you can go ahead and fix that for them as well. Um, and so at, th at this point, you are reviewing compliance. Um, you're reviewing the final, re reviewing the final report, uh, fixing any existing entries, rejecting and having them fix it. Once this report is compiled and it's good to go, you have the option to approve the project for completion. Uh, really quickly, if you see several items that need to be fixed, um, you can reject the project and that's just going to get it out of your queue. By queue, I mean get it out of your final queue, push it back to active. They'll be, you know, fixing their stuff and then resubmitting this. So that's just another way that you can have them fix the stuff. Um, again, that's, you know, if they need to fix it. So if everything is uploaded by them correctly or they've fixed any inconsistencies, um, then you can go ahead and do a pre uh, approve completed project. What that's going to do is, um, let's see, this is a, yeah, we can go ahead and approve this one. Approve completed project. And what that's going to do is it's going to get it out of your um, your final queue, move it into the completed section, and um, it, it, it's done. So as far as the training, we're almost done, but this project has gone through the entire process and it is uh, in the completed status. So a couple of reasons why to keep projects in the final status is if they're non-compliant. I don't know if we have any in here that are non-compliant, but um, if they're non-compliant, they might you know, have to pay a penalty of some sort, right? So uh, we gotta be a little careful with these because these are municipal projects and you know, I, I'm not too sure what the, you know, the, the, the stuff is as far as what happens if a project is non-compliant. Some, some cities, they, you know, the, you know, if it's non-compliant, it'll go to a, you know, to a, to court, for example, or they'll be assessed a hefty penalty, um, you know, just different scenarios. But if the project is compliant, you can move it over to completed. Um, if it's non-compliant, keep it in the final status, try to get a reasoning, that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, just wanted to point that out there. Um, and aside from that, the project has gone through the whole process and it is done you get a notification of the project being completed they'll get a notification of the project being completed and that notification just looks something like this project completed and that's it as far as the entire process of this let me look at my notes just to see if we've uh covered everything but i believe that's it and down the road, you can pop into the statistics and see your stats and stuff like that. But for now, uh, we just want to uh, focus on getting these projects going and, and that type of deal. Wow, Manny, exhale. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that walkthrough. And hopefully folks will see that, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of all the usual suspects, all the usual players, everything that you have in the current Form C is on Green Halo. It's just being organized in a way that it becomes data instead of information, that it becomes automated instead of manually calculated, and that it can help us better understand what we need to be prepared for with respect to material recovery, where we need to focus more on, um, where we have opportunities for improvement, um, maybe even opportunities for, you know, um, bringing some of these recovered materials into regional manufacturing or other other ways to help us close the loop. So we do have a bunch of questions here, um, and I, I'll, I'll start with the ones we've kind of been trying to answer them as we go through, but we'll reiterate them and, and, and then we'll uh, get to the newer questions, give you some time to fill in your questions. So 
Um, the first one has to do with um, how do I access this recording? Um, the recording will be, a link to the recording will be emailed to you next week. We will also be posting them to the SF Environment website. There is a sfenvironment.org backslash CCSF um, shortcut link, which has um, useful links for city employees. So we're planning on uploading it to that location. It's not there yet because we're still recording, but it will be there next week. Um, next question is the permit number the same as the sfdbi permit number if not where does it come from yes if you are dealing with a, a project that is using a uh, dbi for your permit review and and that whole process you will be putting your dbi permit number there there are some agencies that do their own permitting and review like the airport and the port and they issue their own permit numbers and those would be entered instead and there will be a checkbox added um, to this platform uh, or some way of designating whether or not it's a dbi issued permit or someone else's um, where can we find PDFs? I noted that one. Um, who uploads the MRRP? Um, Manny answered that earlier. Um, is this requirement for only lead projects, i.e. if a project is a renovation under 10,000 square feet, um, or is, it, is it still required? So this is a Cal Green requirement. Um, and so in order to be compliant, uh, DBI provided an information sheet with the specific thresholds. And according to them, if you're following form one or two, that's new construction for commercial and residential, um, that would be required. Uh, if it's a, a, over a thousand square feet or more of commercial additions, um, or if it's a project with a valuation of $200,000 or more. So it's really um, going to be that it's it's going to start at a much lower size threshold than a lead threshold because this is not a lead requirement is a Cal green requirement. And I put the link to that DBI um, information sheet in the chat and we'll also send you that link in our follow up. How do we get a login password to the site? Um, your designated point of contact in your department or division will create your account and then notify you directly. The next question is, is this something the design team will set up before construction? So it would be great to set up the project in the system as early in the process as possible because the considerations for material recovery and reuse and waste prevention can be part of your design considerations and we'd like to see that especially as we start to integrate more and more material reuse into our designs um, i also want to acknowledge that your delivery method and your project scale are going to help guide the most suitable timing to initiate so it's not always a one size fits all but you definitely want to get started um, before the mrrp is due so the mrrp itself um, this is a process that typically happens before you start construction as a way of de developing the plan. So um, make sure you have it in the system before construction starts. Um, what does ADC stand for? So this is alternate daily cover, and this is what's placed on top of a landfill, and it pretty much just keeps the landfill from flying away or being uh, picked up and pulled away by um, birds or other animals. Um, it is not recognized by U.S. Green Building Council because, as you can imagine, the top of the landfill yesterday is now today intermingled. So it effectively just becomes another layer of landfill. So it has been kind of disqualified as a recovery recognition um, in the lead rating system. Let's see. Who is responsible for approving the plan? This is important. That is you, the city representative. Just like during the Form C paper version, um, the the city representative is required to review and approve. Um, this is one of the reasons why we're holding these trainings, because we want you to feel comfortable with the process. As you saw, there's going to be a lot of potentially a lot of wait tickets on these projects. Um, and if you're monitoring them on that regular basis, together with payment apps, you don't have to review the 500 <laughs> um, at the very end. And hopefully you'll be able just to review the latest. Um, let's see. Next question. Question, does anyone from SF Environment review the plans or need to be involved in approvals? Currently, we do have an option for projects um, to be reviewed um, at, our, at SFE's discretion, over $100,000, I believe. Um, you can still send us the plans to if you need, if you have questions or guidance. 
Um, of course, we are not prepared to review the plans. Um, is the question is, is this only for new projects? Um, hopefully, um, so if you started with the paper forms, will you continue using paper forms? Yes, you can continue to use paper forms. Um, if you've already started the process, as I mentioned at the top of our time together today, um, if you are very early in the process and you have the opportunity to make the shift, you can see just how much easier it will make the construction process for you, particularly if you're having a prolonged construction period. But if you've already started, you are not required to recreate everything in the platform. Um, sorry, Manny, I'm, I'm co-opting the Q&A, maybe giving you a chance to drink some water, <laughs> but jump in it, <laughs> uh, please. Um, the next question regarding people, is there a search function for finding current users to assign to a project? Imagine the number of people will explode soon. <laughs> Looks like there is no role assigning. Am I correct that anyone assigned has the same level of access and ability to edit project info? Manny, can you take that one? Uh, yeah, so if, if we take a look here um, at this project or any project, really, you can see, I, I guess, even before that, when you log in the search, it does allow you to search by project managers, account holders, and we are working on getting some further uh, items placed in here. So, um, you know, you know, uh, I'd have to look at my notes, but I think it's something like, you know, contractors, city reps. Um, uh, and eventually getting to the point where if you search, you can search by your department. So um, at least that way, you know, if the airport, you know, search by department, maybe airport. Uh, so, yeah, we are working on ways to filter this out. But most of these projects will be, you'll be able to uh, to to, you know, by permit number, I'd say is the most accurate uh, just because at a, at a specific address, you might have 10 permits. Right. But the same address. So by permit number is going to be the most accurate. And. Also, if you look at any one of these projects, so even like this one here, the one by Scansco, this project is specifically assigned to to Scansco, right? But there is one person only that is managing this project. So that person is uh, Cassandra. So if you search Cassandra on the previous screen, again, account holder, Cassandra, you know, that project, even though Scansco has a thousand employees and who knows what, Cassandra is the person who is responsible for managing this project. You don't want to have 10 people at Skanska doing this because what if all 10 people drop the ball or just too many people involved or whatever the case is. But basically, you can search here by account holder Cassandra. Thank you, Manny. Mm -hmm. And it also looks like, yes, um, so other other folks who are city representatives who have accounts in the system will be able to see um, other projects happening in the system. Um, so they will have the ability to see the other projects in your department, for example. Uh, once the project is assigned to a contractor, is the MRRP locked so only the contractor can edit? I believe the answer to that is no, but Amanda? Uh, let's see, once the project is assigned to the contractor, is the MRRP locked so? Uh... Yes and no. So as far as um, if we go into upcoming, at any point you can edit the project information. But um, so so like for example, once they've identified their transportation and materials, that that stuff it's just a plan, right? So it's just estimates. So now the system's comparing estimates versus actuals. A lot of people kind of think, okay, if my plan was to do C and D and recology, but as I'm doing my actual construction work, I want to go back and update my plan then, you know, it's just a lot of extra work. So it's not required to update your plan. It's just at the end, you have a, a report of everything going on. So yeah, um, yeah as far as th these items, right? Materials, transportation and stuff. Um, but this project information can be updated at any point. Like if the pro we get an update, the project is not gonna end in 2021 on this day, it's gonna end in 2022. You can edit this and update this type of information. Great. Yeah, I think it's worth reiterating that the plan is your best guess at the beginning of the project. It's the best estimate of what you think is going to happen um, with materials, who you think the facilities are going to be to receive it, who are the transporters, et cetera. Um, of course, plans change. You might find something on the site that changes your reality, 
or you know a facility may no, may no longer offer the third party verified rates that you're wanting to achieve there is any reason for a change in the game um, it won't change your plan but it will change what you what you record throughout the process and that's why as Manny was showing earlier the two different pie charts of you know maybe suddenly you want you know, excavate something you find something it changes your scope it adds a lot of new material into your demolition or your excavation well now you're now you're tracking that material and we understand that but then if you see a percentage of you know suddenly you've got 10 more tons of material um you understand why that is and so that's a big a big part of this um hopefully uh hopefully that helps you see your best guess and then you see your actuals um is there a help desk number for us to call a uh, man if you scroll to the top maybe you can uh, highlight that flashing <laughs> then that flashing number uh online um at the top of the screen there you will see a 1-800 or 1-888 number to call and the operating hours manny uh, oh yeah, sorry about that. Uh, that me? All right. That's not. That's not oh, you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, so operating hour. Yeah, Monday through Friday Pacific time. Um, you know, eight, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. But you know, we we do have people that get in at 7 a.m. So um, just to accommodate, you know, th that. So I, I'd say really 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. But I do want to point out that. You know the busiest peak times are usually eight in the morning, twelve noon, and then after like four fifteen, four thirty, a high volume of calls. So if you do call later on the day, um, we'll probably call you back the next day. Just wanted to point that out. But um, yeah, M Monday through Friday Pacific time. Our office is located here in San Jose, so we're, we're local. Perfect. Thank you. Um, let's see. When can the contracting community expect to receive training on Green Halo? And as we mentioned, we are recording today's session and, we, and uh, Manny did cover some of the contractors roles. So we do think that they would be able to benefit from that recording as well. We have user guides that are created one for the generic uh, general uh, agency account for the administrator, one for the city representative and another for the general contractor. It's worth noting that many of the general contractors who work in San Francisco have already been using Green Halo. Some have even customized their own internal platforms within Green Halo um, and could probably teach a, probably even teach a class on it themselves. Um, we will gauge to see how many contractors are looking for guidance and assistance that go beyond a uh, you know, a customer service call or help from SFE periodically, and, and then we'll determine whether a formal training will be necessary in addition to these other resources. Uh, let's see, next question. Who does the general contractor reach out to in order to have an account created for a project? That is the city representative. So when the, when the project gets handed over to you, um, Manny walked you through the process earlier in the session. I know there's a lot of material covered here. Um, and it will also be in your, your user guide, but you will, um, yep, thank you, Manny. Uh, do you wanna walk them through the process one more time? Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's just uh, assigning the project. So um, that part was here in the, you know, you, you pinpoint your project, you get to the point where you see your project. And then uh, in this case, we're, we'll just choose one of these plans for client and functions assign project. There you and go. then you, en you enter their email. You enter their email. If they're in the system, it will say assign. And if they're not in the system, it will say invite. And they will be notified and they will be um, then in the system. And this will also be, uh, there will also be a reminder in the user guide on how to do this um, because we know that we're covering a lot of ground here. Um, let's see. There's a follow up question on the regarding the people to um, that to clarify uh, asking if there's such a search function within the people section in the project information page and in that field you know maybe lauren let me see if i can unmute you so that you can ask your question i can find you um lauren you should be unmuted Thanks, Eden. Yeah, I'm just trying to um, trying to understand in the project information section, there was a place where you added a bunch of people to the project, Manny. It wasn't mm -hmm. like assigning the project to contractors, just listing people who have access to the project. And I didn't see in there if it like made clear within the project information who the city representative on the project is. 
Um, I know sometimes in my department, like the that representative changes if people are assigned to different projects or retire or whatever. So just want to make sure whoever's looking in there can see clearly who that city rep is. Yeah, and then just to be clear, um, designated contacts. I think this mm -hmm. is what you're referring to here. But yeah. these people, these people, uh, like assuming I have the contractor and the, and let's say twenty subcontractors, these people do not. In this case, Emily and Anthony do have access to this. But if you had twenty subcontractors, that, that's why we, we had emphasized that whoever gets added to this designated contacts, like the car, the uh, architect, contractor, subcontractor, city rep, city administrator. The only people that are going to have access to this are the city admin, city reps, and uh, the account holder. Um, and so, if you have if you have subcontract subcontractors, like let's say the electricians are listed here, they don't automatically get access to Green Halo to start uploading tickets and doing this and that to the project. They have to go through the account holder and give those tickets to the account holder because the account holder is pretty much the the one responsible for all of this. Okay, but those designated, Mike, I guess my question is those designated contacts all mm -hmm. have access to change the project information. It's um, there's no clear role for which one of them is this is the city representative or I mean, I guess it doesn't matter all that much. I just um, I'm trying to mm -hmm. confirm. Uh, yeah, I, I just think that we don't have a clear example here, right? So if, if I go through these and maybe it was um, maybe upcoming, maybe, yeah, that might be a better example. So if we go in here and we um, look at these designated contacts, um, the, I try to kind of mix it up a little bit more. And in this case, you know, this contractor, uh, you know, if we had subcontractors listed here as well, yes. just because you add them and designate them as contacts, they do not have access to this. If this is just when, like, for example, say you print this report at the end, it's going to give you, here's all the people associated to the project. However, only the main person filling this out, basically the account holder is the one that is going to have access to this. And you can add in the position field uh, city representative, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that might be a good way of designating them when you create the project. If you, since you are actually an administrator, you would create it and then um, as their position, you would write pretty representative and that might be the way to do it. Okay, and then this that you're on right now is sort of the box where I was wondering, is there a search function in this um, box that will fill up with a bunch of city people over time? Uh, yeah, this this actually a yeah, good point on that. That might be something that once we start to see more people, we should probably add some type of search function in here. That's a good good point there, yeah. Thanks, Lauren. I see that um, it looks like, um, did over all the questions, oh, there's one other question. It seems like this platform means greater involvement and time for the design team. Currently, all the design team needs to do is ensure that the requirements are in the specs and it's up to the contractor to take it over after. More hours means greater fee. Unfortunately, that's not entirely true. It is currently the requirement of the city representative to be approving the MRP, to be reviewing the monthly reports, um, and to be making sure that what the manu what the general contractor said they were going to do in terms of recovery has been done. So um, this is actually a way to reduce that time and make it less time and less fee for you all um, than um, if you were actually going through doing all the paper review, making sure that all the math is right, manually checking every single way ticket against another line on another page. Um, and so the intent is to actually make it easier. Um, so hopefully that clarifies that question. Yeah, I, yeah please uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to add a couple of things. I mean, as far as, you know, if you were to pass the ball to a person, right, in this case, you know, um, there might be, you know, having, you know, before it was maybe passing a piece of paper to them, filling it out and they give it back to you. In this case, maybe passing it through the system, through email, you know, that might take a little bit longer as far as them having to check their email, accept it, that type of stuff. But the goal here is really to have a really good plan in place. And so when you have a good plan in place, um, you know, at the beginning, uh, even though plans may change or whatever, you have a really good plan in place, most likely at the end, 
that the chances of this, you know, because it's tracking everything, right? My project might be active for a year. And if I see that it's in the red four months into it, okay, what can I do now to get this back in the green? So it's kind of like, mm. kind of like, like the stock market, um, you know, if it's in the red, sell it green, you know, buy or whatever, but it, you have ways to adapt and make changes and you get a monthly reminder saying, I don't have tickets uploaded, you know, and not that I want to promote this, but, you know, if we take a look at this other project, you know, a lot of cities, you know, I wouldn't say do this on your first project, but, you know, like this is a live project. And if there's anybody from the airport on here, you know, uh, you know, sorry, I'm using this as an example, but, you know, if I know that this was uploaded by Cassandra, right, and I, I see Cassandra's, you know, uploaded 54 tickets, I can expand all these, but let's just focus on these first 10. You know, you could pull this open and this is a live project, right? So I don't know if, you know, if what we see is what, what we're, you know, we're hoping to get Zanker tickets and accuracy. And, you know, so if we take a look at this, March 12th, 2019, um, 4.05 tons, 4.05 tons. Ticket number, uh, we'd have to 203693335. It looks good to me. But my point is this ticket looks good. Say I pop, pop open this one, spot checking, right? Now I can skip to the, this one. I can skip to this one, you know, just, you know, something like that, or even just popping open all of these. The main thing is, is at the end, there's going to be tremendous benefits, right? If I, if I just do something like this and I'm just looking for construction debris, you know, construction debris, you know, there's, there's going to be little tricks that you can do construction debris. And if everything is construction debris, I know that, you know, they've complied and you can get to a point where you can kind of spot check a little bit more, but, um, you know, we, at the beginning, I'd say it's, it's good to just review every single thing very accurately and make sure that if the project achieved 92.34%, the system is doing its job and all you have to do is just confirm the tickets. You don't have to calculate the numbers and the diversions and, you know, stuff like that. Really appreciate that clarification. And it's always good to see one more time the, the this aspect of the program because this is the one that I imagine uh, city representatives are going to use the most. Um, we're coming up on the end of our time together, or at least our scheduled time together today. Um, Manny cannot thank you enough for helping <laughs> us with this walkthrough. Um, it's been incredibly informative. And to all of you, I know this was a lot of information. Um, we will be very happy to get you the recording so you can listen to this again. Um, the user guides will go out before even the recording is available, so you'll be able to have that at your fingertips. And of course, that flashing number at the top of the screen um, or the debris recovery at sfgov.org. Um, you can reach out to us if you need help or assistance as you get started. So with that, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, be well, stay safe. and. Thanks again for joining us.